Knock, knock. Who's there? To. To who? No, it's to whom. Gotcha. <laughs> it's true. I am kind of that guy. Like, I'm sure that you've seen me. If you're in the supermarket and you got the line and you're counting up the objects, the person in front of you to see if they really have 10 items or less, I'm that guy who's holding up the line, explaining to the cashier that the sign should say 10 items or fewer. You know, or like, when, ladies, when you get out of a movie and you're upset because there's a long line for the women's room, I'm upset too, because where is the apostrophe? <laughs> now, I know that in some ways, you know, this is ridiculous behavior. I have some excuses. As Nick said, I'm, I am a PhD. I've been teaching English now for 36 years. But I know that this stuff is ridiculous, my behavior. But here's what's more ridiculous. There are a lot of people out there who take this stuff way more seriously than I do. When I was in middle school, I spent years underlining verbs and bracketing dependent clauses. And you know, I don't give those assignments to my students. Now, some of my colleagues think that that's a big mistake. I mean, they think that we're in a battle. Sometimes they even call it a war. And they think that we're losing. They think that language is going down this slope that is deteriorating and is ultimately going to lead to like cultural rot, that we're being assailed by text messages and emojis. And you know what? I don't agree with them. I am not worried about that. Why not? Well, have you ever considered why English is such a hard language for adults to learn? Why it has so many rules and so many exceptions? Well, consider its history. English began as a Germanic language that arrived at the shores of Britain about 1,500 years ago. And there, it was, uh, they were getting there just as the Romans were leaving, taking the Latin with them. And so they settled down with the Scot and with the Celtic languages, and they got to see the Scandinavian Vikings when they came by on raids. And then, about 1,000 years ago, after the Norman Conquest, it was replaced by French at least by the people up in the castles, and at least for a little while. And then it reemerged, stronger than ever. But even in Shakespeare's day, English was still borrowing words all the time from Latin and from Greek, because those were the educated languages of the day. And after that, it got exported around the world. So for the next 500 years, English was exported to around the world to everywhere where it encountered lots of different languages, lots of different cultures. And from almost all of them, it absorbed words and constructions and idioms. So why is English so hard to learn for adults? Because English is really not a language of a country or of a culture. It is a language of the world. It is a language of all classes of people. And despite the best efforts of some people to try to make it behave, it has emerged as this great, big, glorious, fantastic, adaptable Frankenstein of a language. It's got a passport that is threadbare and worn. Nevertheless, people have been freaking out about changes in the English language, not just now, but really for hundreds of years. In the 1700s, writers were incredibly alarmed that anyone would use contact as a verb, or that anyone would use broadcast outside of its meaning of scattering seeds. Even the English grammar that I learned as a child in middle school, I mean, that was created by a group of intellectuals in Britain, like, during the Enlightenment. And they thought that English was a decayed and degenerate form of Latin that it needs to be made to obey the rules that, you know, Latin follows, and that everybody should speak the way a few rich people of their day spoke. Now, the truth about English is if there's a roast about English, it's that it is difficult and hard to learn and has a lot of exceptions. But its greatest strength is that English has so many words, it has so many dialects, it has so many ways of putting things together and making meaning. I love the English language. And remember that Mark Twain did not write the masterpiece Huckleberry Finn by being grammatically correct. He wrote it by paying attention to the vernacular, to the power of the way people actually spoke. Walt Whitman put it best. 
Language is not the construction of the learned or dictionary makers, but rather it arises from the works, joys, ties, affections of long generations of humanity. And it has its basis broad and low, close to the ground. Broad and low, close to the ground. That's really true about American English, which has been enriched not only by so many languages and cultures, but today by the internet, by text messaging, by people communicating on their mobile phones. The English language is an expression of our values of democracy and diversity and the power of every voice. Okay, but let's go back to school for a minute, because that's where we're supposed to be teaching language skills. So I went back to school. I went back to school after 15 years of teaching English. And one of the things I wanted to learn about is a little bit more about this, uh, this traditional grammar that had so consumed my middle school years. And I had this suspicion, which it turns out was backed up by the research. I had this suspicion that the traditional study of grammar really doesn't help people very much at all. I know that that seems counterintuitive, but part of the problem is that we're often we're talking about grammar not even talking about the same things. Like, take a list, look at this list of rules. The National Council of Teachers of English, which is the group that tracks this stuff, the authority that's in charge of it, has had this position for more than 50 years, that the teaching of formal grammar does not help a student's ability to speak, to write, to think, or to learn foreign languages. Now, stop for a minute. Just stop and think about that. I mean, this is the leading group that looks at all of this research, and we have kids who spend hundreds of hours every year in the classroom on this, and their position is that it doesn't help you in your own language, and it doesn't help you in any other language? What? <laughs> right? So one thing you can do with this research is you can reject it, and plenty of my colleagues do. I mean, they have pretty much put themselves in the trenches on this. <laughs> and their attitude is pretty much, damn the research boys, we know what works, right? You can have my copy of Warner's Grammar when you pry it from my cold, dead hands. And then on the other side of the battlefield, you have a lot of teachers spending more time with reading and writing. You know, they, they're expanding the canon of authors that they read. Uh, they're trying out new critical approaches. They're learning to, write, to run a writing workshop. And they probably never even studied traditional grammar, the younger ones. And so in the middle here, you have this no man's land where nothing's happening with language. Nobody's doing anything. It's just dead. Well, do we care about that? Yeah, I do. I really care about that. I think we need to be reinventing language study. And I think that the place to start with that is to go back and look at those rules. So people have strong feelings about these rules, and they, they're happy to argue about them. But here's what almost nobody notices, because it's just so accepted. They all start with the word don't, right? So in my mind, that's like the battlefield has little like mines hidden underneath. And students learn that when they walk on what they thought was the solid ground of language, it might blow up under them at any minute. The thing to do is don't walk there. I mean, you can follow all these rules by not using language at all. I have a Jack Russell Terrier at home that follows every one of these language <laughs> rules. Right? So, I think we need to look at that in terms of like learning theory. Like, say that you want to teach somebody to shoot hoops, okay? So imagine that you can just get them in their mind's eye to feel the, the power coming from the legs, going through their body, through their arm, and just watch that ball, imagine it spinning and dropping through the hoop. You do that 500 times, that's as good as actually shooting hundreds of baskets, really. What would happen if instead we said, you need to memorize a hundred ways the ball's going to bounce off the rim and not go through the hoop? See, I think that what we need to do is scrap all this talk of battlefields and war and really start just by basic principles. What do we want kids to do with language? I think what we want them to do is to appreciate and understand and learn to expand 
the amazing abilities they have just by virtue of being human beings. And I think the first thing we need to do is work on the metaphor. And I think the metaphor for language learning instead should be a playground. And if you think it's going to be hard to build a curriculum based on the idea of language play, you're wrong. Because kids love play. They're naturally attracted to it. I mean, play is creative. And play is fun. And I mean, think about, think about what brings kids joy. I mean, have you ever had seen a third grader who has gotten a hold of a book of jokes and riddles? <laughs> have you ever tried to take it away from them? You know, or some kids who have learned to talk a secret language, like Valerian from Game of Thrones, or write a secret message in code, or an invisible message in invisible ink. All of these activities are rich in the potential for language learning. I actually teach a linguistics course to fourth graders. And we get into a lot of interesting questions. Questions like, where did words come from? Who decides what they mean? How are languages born? How do they die? You know, how do toddlers manage to master hundreds of words of vocabulary and complex grammatical concepts when we can't reliably depend on them to put their underwear on straight. <laughs> I mean, this is, where, this is where my life's work has led me. You know, not to thinking about how to get kids to obey rules, but about how to extend what they already can do and how they can come to appreciate it. So let me give you a couple of examples. So one place it's good to start is with headlines. Because headlines have to be really short, and sometimes they convey unexpected meanings. So a while ago, the Hershey Company wanted to prevent its workers from protesting, and the newspaper ran a story about it with this headline. Now, we know what they mean, right? But it's hard not to imagine a bunch of Hershey bars, you know, marching up on the picket line, right? Or, Something like, uh, American ships head to Iran. You wonder, what kind of a box did he use for that? Was it parcel post or, you know? Or, Iraqi head seeks arm, and you get this image of body parts in the desert trying to put itself together. Or, tuna biting off the Washington coast. You know, so this is actually a good place to introduce the concept of parts of speech, because the only way it works as a joke is because words can play more than one possible role in a sentence. And what this also surfaces is a fact about English that I bet you never learned in traditional cl grammar classes, which is that word order is the single most important meaning-making device in the English language, which is why if you, if you take something like, I hit my brother on his arm, and you add the word only, Every place you put it is going to make a different meaning. Only I hit my brother on his arm. I only hit my brother on his arm. I hit my only brother on his arm. I hit my brother on his only arm. Right? <laughs> Everywhere makes a different meaning. Here's another example that I invented to show kids they know a lot more about language than they think they know. If I put those words on the screen, every native English speaker will automatically put them in the same order. OK, let's try it. Ready together. The little red schoolhouse. So maybe you've heard that phrase before. Let's try it with something you've never seen before. OK? The two ugly English teachers. OK, again, seems like it's ridiculously easy, and it is for us. But how would you explain to somebody who was just learning English why you had to put them in that order and no other, and why you can't say the school red little house? You know, we seem to be following a rule here, but we don't even necessarily know what it is. There really are an infinite number of examples, but let's just take one more. OK, here's a situation I want you to imagine. Suppose you are in line for a Redskins game, and your dad is supposed to meet you. But he's running late, and so you realize he's not going to make it. You're going to have to give your ticket away. OK, so I gave my t extra ticket to the guy behind me. Just remember that sentence. I gave my extra ticket to the guy behind me. Now let's see what happens if we start with the word you. You gave your extra ticket to the guy behind you, right? And he gave his extra ticket to the guy behind him, him right? And she gave her extra ticket to the guy behind her, and we gave our extra ticket to the guy behind us, and they gave their extra ticket to the guy behind them. Again, ridiculously easy for us, but think how hard it would be to do this if you were just learning English. You would have to memorize those three columns You'd have to you know, figure out which one is which, and 
how would we explain to someone how we do it automatically and never make a mistake, and why we don't have to do it with something like Hunt gave Hunt's extra ticket to the guy behind Hunt, right? <laughs> one more example. English has an enormous vocabulary. It's one of the great things about English. But like all languages, English has some funny holes in it. And these were identified by the linguist Richard Lederer. So, for example, what do you call citizens of the United States? We can call them Americans, but I'm not sure how people in Mexico and Canada feel about that. You know, when you're 45 years old, do you really need to introduce that person as your boyfriend or your girlfriend? <laughs> Most of my students have never seen a telephone dial. You know, so why do we still use that word? You know, we know that rotten flowers stink. What's the word for how they smell before they rot? And love is a word that we use for so many things. I mean, I love my wife, I love my son, I love my country. You know what, I love amusement parks. I love chocolate, and I love your new hat. Maybe we need more than one word for all those concepts. So let's make some up. You know, let's go and, and, and figure out how word parts get put together. And, and then let's see how the dictionary writes them up, and let's do that, and most important, let's take them out to the world and try to use them. Speaking of new vocabulary, Technology has been the greatest generator of new vocabulary and language over the course of my lifetime. I mean, I now ha regularly have entire conversations I would not have remotely understood when I was a young man. So what about that? Where did those words come from? And how is texting changing English? And what's the grammar of Facebook and Instagram? You know, how are emojis you know, supplanting and sometimes replacing punctuation. Nobody is saying, and I'm certainly not saying, that standard English doesn't have its place. Of course it does. In formal situations, it can be essential. That's why people seek out the advice of Grammar Girl. That's why applications such as Grammarly, you know, can help people avoid unclear uh, phrasings and, you know, words that might be as inappropriate as wearing a tank top to a wedding. But it is amazing that by making noises with my mouth, I can put a picture in your head of a purple penguin wearing an orange tutu doing a dab. <laughs> and how much more amazing is it possibly that by looking at black marks on white pieces of paper, we can share in the thoughts and feelings of people who lived thousands of years ago and thousands of miles away. If language gave our species a key evolutionary advantage 100,000 years ago or more, how much more essential is it today when we can transmit those thoughts and feelings around the world in the blink of an eye to audiences of millions of people? How can we possibly be navigating this amazingly fast-moving time in which we're living without paying particular attention to the miracle of human language. I say it's time to put away this talk of battles and warfare. We need to get kids on the swings, get them up on the slides, get them to appreciate and enjoy and hopefully fall in love with the amazing phenomenon of human language. Thank you.